and in and um, a public intellectual in relation to racism, anti-racism, multiculturalism in France and in the European con context. So it is wonderful uh, that you join us. Um, so I, I click this just a second that you join us, uh, Michel. Uh, and Michel, France is having a bit of a difficult time. The trial is taking place of one of the people accused of being involved in the bombing um, of years ago. There is a rise of a right-wing pundit of Le Figaro, Zemmour, um, who, like Trump, argues that everything is rigged and um, maybe a contender for the presidency. And in the words of André Gide, he is a full manager who debases the coin of the realm. Um, there's also a, the French setback in the Indo-Pacific due to devious and in, inept um, conduct. Um, our audience is international audience from many quarters. Um, greetings to you all. And um, uh, <laughs> it includes also uh, colleagues of UCSB, bien sûr, uh, and of global studies. Um, and meanwhile, Michel, we all love Paris in the autumn. So uh, we are grateful to you for giving us a respite and a reprieve uh, for the Paris um, ambience and um, a respite from our uh, circumstances. So um, here is to We Love Paris in the Autumn. Michel Vierwerka, bienvenue. Uh, please, a warm welcome for, uh, for uh, Michel. Thank you so much, uh, Jan. It's uh, a pleasure and an honor to participate in your program. So I'm very grateful. And um, well, I am in my flat, but I cannot show you anything from Paris because it's night in Paris. And uh, I'm just looking by the window. Usually I can see the roof of Notre Dame. Ah, let me show you something. If you see some light far from my room here, the, the light you can see is Notre Dame. But I don't know if you could see something, but I live not so far from Notre Dame. We burnt a few years ago and they are now, it is now recovery. So usually I like to speak globally. And we were discussing a few minutes ago about Ulrich Beck, who used to tell us not to practice methodological nationalism, to speak and think globally. Yes, but I will also today speak locally. I will speak about France, but I think that what I'm going to say about France could be useful for a more general uh, audience that want to discuss these issues of racism, anti-Semitism, and anti-racism. So I know that these phenomena are global at the world scale, but also that in each country, you have important changes from one country to another one. And France, unfortunately, is a real laboratory for all these issues. Of course, we have in France our own specificities, and maybe we can draw from this specific case some more general lessons for a more general scope. And maybe for instance, compare with uh, the US. But here I will deal with France. I would also tell you that I will not enter a very interesting discussion, but I have no time for that. I will just tell you what is this discussion. The question is, is anti-Semitism a racism among other, or is it something unique 
that you cannot consider participating in the family of racism in general. So it's an interesting discussion. I will just tell you what is my position in this debate. When I am a sociologist, I can say that antisemitism is not so different from other forms of racism. But when I am an historian, I think, well, no other human group but Jews have known during two and a half uh, million years, thousands of years, hatred, perpetual, continuous hatred. It's unique. So hatred toward Jews is unique as a, this has been is unique for it because of its continuity in time, but it is not so unique if you consider other forms of racism. This is my way of discussing this issue, but I will not open too much this box, which is interesting, but so. So I would like to start with the fact that France has been a colonial power and the racism in France owes much to an expansion. And this expansion began really in the 16th century. And the more important was the expansion, not in the 16th century, but in the second half of the 19th century. And of course, the expansion ended with the Second World War. So <clears throat> first of all, when we say that France has been a colonial power, it is we don't speak about colonialism and uh, like we can speak of colonialism in a country like the US. The question was not expansion of the country in the US. My second point, and maybe some of you have read, for instance, the Israeli historian Zef Sternel, France has been also a world laboratory for racist ideas, for the idea of race. Uh, some anti-enlightenment uh, thinkers have been very important. It started in the 18th century. But the more important here was also the 19th century. I will just tell you that, just to give you some names, Gobineau, Vacher de la Pouge have really been pioneers in the building of uh, race as a real category. Not the American more recent idea of race as a social construction. But the idea that there are biological races, friends have been very important in the sphere of ideas. Now, I must say that there is something really French in colonizing and in the racism that was coming with colonization. The fact is that French colonization generally included or involved a paradox. Colonizing meant racism. It meant considering other people as inferior, as biologically inferior, naturally inferior. So you can exploit them. You can do whatever you, who you want with them on the one hand. And this led to what some experts call inferiorization racism. I consider a human group as being inferior, so I can exploit them. But in the same time, the French uh, idea of colonization was that we, the French people, are offering access to modernity for these people that are being colonized. They shall receive education. They shall receive health. They shall receive many things that mean modernity. And one day, they will be modern as we are modern. This was the idea of most important coloni French colonizer in the second half of the 19th century. This is very French. Other colonizing countries were not thinking that they were helping these people that were colonized to enter modernity. It was not like that. French is rather unique here, and it's a real paradox. But now I would like to uh, deal with contemporary or more recent racism in France, even if old forms of racism don't disappear. They never totally disappear, but things have been changing. 
First of all, one must understand that racism today is first of all directed to migrants or children of migrants, descendants, and at the beginning to migrants that were or that are descendants of formerly colonized people on the one hand. But we have also in France something which is also rather unique today. We have a certain number of, of places which are more or less still colonized places and places where inhabitants, some of them, not all, all of them, some inhabitants are black people that were brought as slaves in the past. If I say French Caribbeans, if I say French Ile de la Réunion, to take these two main cases, I mean, on the one hand, colonizing people, some migrants coming from different origins, but also a certain number of people whose ancestors were slaves. This is why the French Caribs are maybe closer to the United States than to the French metropolis. And for instance, to say it differently, in some American universities, the French literature coming from these islands, from La Martinique or from La Guadeloupe, is much more known than in French universities. You know much more in many American universities, Edouard Glissant, for instance, and others. And this is uh, very interesting. It is because what he says has more to do with the American experience than with the, the French one. So we must have this in mind if we want to compare. The, the history is absolutely so different. Now, what, what has been the history that uh, still exert a strong in, influence on, on France? It is an history where the decolonization and when I said decolonization, I should say that there was, there was a lot of violence. The main cases are two. The, what the French called Indochine, but they call it in America, Vietnam, first of all. But this is so far that people don't consider it as very important today. And the second war was in Algeria. And this is absolutely a key issue. So what happened? is that decolonization meant war, even in the French authorities did not want officially to call it a war. It is only 35 years after the end of this war that the French president, Jacques Chirac said, we must call it a, a war. So what happened is that war, which means for some French people, ah, they don't want to be part of our modernity. So there is a strange resentment, and this is very important because some of the people that came to France after the 60s or, or sometimes before, but were coming from these former colonies, and first of all, from Algeria. And there, so racism could have something to do with a kind of resentment. What are these people that did not accept French modernity? But then why did these people come to France in the 50s or in the 60s? It's a little bit like the American Mexican program, which is called Bracero. That is to say, people were invited to come in order to work in French factories, sometimes also in French fields, but mainly in French factories. It was a time with French, which has been destroyed by the Second World War, was recovering. And it was a time when the country really needed a lot of workers in the factories. So these people that used to come from Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, this, that is to say the former colony, they were invited to come for work. They were, we called them like that, migrant workers. They usually were male, a very, very limited number of females. They usually did not plan to stay in France. They planned to come back to their country with some money, then buy a, lor a, a lorry or buy a restaurant or a garage or a, 
or, or built a house with the money, but their life was in their country where they were coming from. They were here without children, without wife. They were included by work, but out of work, they had nothing to do with French life because they did not have children going to school. They did not have, uh, uh, they did not participate in elections and so on. So this was during the 50s, the 60s, and the early 70s. And during that time, there was a lot of racism. It was a rather classical racism that considered these people as inferior. And it was a, more or less like a colonial racism, but with something more, which was the resentment. These people were making war with us, but it was not so strong. Then things changed a lot. And this is what I must explain maybe, um, maybe to, to you. What happened is that in the mid 70s, a lot of sh things changed. First of all, after the, mm, mm, uh, the, the war between Israel and Arab countries in 73, there was what we call a, a shock, a, pit, a gas shock, I don't know the English word. There was, a, a, a big crisis with oil, with the price of oil, because Arab, Arab countries decided to, to, to raise strongly the price, and suddenly began the beginning of an economic crisis in France. At the same moment, a lot of uh, big factories decided to change the way they were uh, managing people, the way they were organizing the work the, and the workplace, it was the beginning of the end of the so-called Taylorization. You know, Charlie Chaplin in, in modern times. Really? This. So it was the beginning of the end of this new management, new forms of organization. And suddenly it became clear that all these people, all these migrants, male, coming from their country and thinking that they will go back to their country, they were, not they were now not necessary. They were no longer useful to, that, to the country. And for this reason, these people were more or less obliged to choose. Do they stay in France or do they come back to their country? It was not clear that this was a big economic crisis. Nobody could imagine this. And there was some law, I cannot be more precise, that made possible for these people the so-called family grouping. That is to say, the law said that they could have wife and children in France. So what do you do? Do you stay in France with wife, children now, and maybe work will come back and the situation will improve and so on. And life in France is much more easy than in Morocco or Algeria or Tunisia. Or do you come back to Tunisia, Algeria or Morocco? Many of these migrant workers decided to stay. And of course, this changes a lot the situation because they decided to stay at the very moment when there was no job for them. So oh. just, just imagine. So these people were given, in many cases, flats in some popular suburbs because in these popular suburbs, the people that were there 10 years before or five years ago were having some... Uh, uh, upwards mobility and could leave the popular suburbs to go to the to go back to more pleasant uh, places. So it was the beginning of the urban crisis, the so-called crisis of the banlieue, the suburbs, the French oui. popular oui. suburb. And it was a lot. There was a lot of trans transformation in racism. Why? When you consider a human group as not useful. You don't consider yet that you must exploit these people that because you can consider that they are inferior. The classical colonial racism meant I exploit these people and I say that I can do it because they are inferior. But things were changing. The idea was now we don't need these people. They take my job. It was a, a very important idea. And so racism trans was transformed into what some experts used to call differentialist racism or cultural racism and, and many other or new racism. 
And this, yes. uh, and this had something to do with what had been beginning maybe five or 10 years before in the USA, when you had a certain number of psychologists and political scientists that were describing also this kind of phenomenon with black people saying, black people now, the problem is not, is not that we should exploit them. The problem is that they will never accept the American creed. They will never accept family values. They don't want to work. They want to receive money from the state and stay home and this kind of ideas. So racism was passing from a classical colonial inferiorizing form of hatred and prejudice and so on to a differentialist uh, way of thinking insisting on cultural aspects. These people now were described as not able to participate in the French culture. And of course, this was a strong feeling among nationalist people. And it's in the 80s, it was also the beginning of, the, uh, of a political party, the National Front, that played with this idea. We don't need these people. They take my job, they take my lodging, they take my house, and, and, uh, and so on. Of course, of course, you don't have the total disappearance of the first racism and the only the second one. It was a mixture of both phenomena, but the tendency was more and more cultural racism, to call it like that, and less and less classical colonial uh, racism. So this was shaping racism in the seven, late 70s, 80s, and 90s. But we are now 20 or 30 years later, and the story is not finished. So now I would like to say a few words about three important stages in the transformation of contemporary racism in France after what I described, and I tried to speak not only of the French metropole, but also of uh, Caraïbes and so on. But the, the main case, the main problem was the transformation of migration and the transformation of racism related with this transformation of migrations. Michel, permettez of cinq uh, minutes, is okay? Of course. Merci. <laughs> cinq uh, minutes environ, huh? très intéressant. So what, what do you mean by five minutes? We should stop? Uh, Another five minutes, so we stop at one o'clock. Is that okay? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, okay. Seven, no, five I'm or right. seven minutes from now. I need, I need five or seven minutes to finish with racism. Then I would like to deal with anti-Semitism. Okay? Okay. Take into account the time. No, we can go until, Brett, we can go until 1.15. Yeah, we, we yeah, can go. There's time. We, we can go another uh, 20 minutes, actually. Okay, so give me three or five minutes to finish with the transformation of racism, and then I will deal with the transformation of anti Semitism, which are also a big issue. So to be as short as possible. 20, 20 minutes, Michel. Okay. Oh, no. okay. Oh, no. So, okay. So I don't insist anymore on this transformation to cultural uh, racism. The second, a second important transformation, so was <clears throat> the idea, which is more recent, that not only these people, the racist targets, uh, the, not only these people don't want to integrate which was the main idea in the 80s or the 90s, but something different happened because religion became a key issue due to Islam. Before the 90s or the 80s, Islam was not a key issue in France. But now, after the 90s, let us say, it became very important. And this had a very important effect on, on racism because now these people that were vic victims of pure racism, hatred because of color of skin or so, then were hated also because they did not to, they were supposed not to integrate in the French culture. But then the new aspect was, oh, they are bringing in France Islam. 
and Islam means terrorism. And Islam also for French people means historical wars. You know, when I was very, very young, when I, went, was, when I was eight or 10 years old, when I went to school, my first lessons in history was in 732, Charles Martel, a kind of mayor of Paris, defeated Muslims and uh, people that were Muslims and Arabs in Poitiers, in the city, which means we stopped these people. So then we had crusades, then a lot of things made that there is a very strong history between Islam and France, which is not the case for USA, for instance, or not so much. So difference was perceived as a danger, not only as a problem of people refusing integration. And so this was a second important point because it transformed also uh, racism. And then there was a third stage in the transformation of racism, racism much more, which is the fact that a certain number of people that are victims of racism began to say, well, you say that I am different. I will be different. You say that I belong to a race. I will belong to a race. You, and you say that I don't want to integrate your culture. Yes, I have another culture. I am bringing something different. Sometimes it was very, and this is why I, I was a defender of multiculturalism. Sometimes it was very good from my point of view for the French society, because it means new cultural dimensions in collective life. But sometimes there were excesses. There were uh, tendencies to create a, a war between races like there is sometimes tendencies to build a war between genders. So what happened is that these people that were ex in excess, that, were, that wanted to make war with white people and not to fight against racism, for instance, became more and more visible and active. And the public debate today in France takes this very seriously into consideration. It's a very difficult debate because those people that hate this idea of groups, minorities, promoting the, their own image of a race, those people that, are, that criticize this very often are the same people that, don't, that criticize social movements, cultural movements, protests, and so on. So it's difficult to, to, to discuss seriously but racism was transformed, and this is my last point on racism, because you had different fragments within the society, each fragment now may be racist towards other fragments of the society or towards the dominant group. For instance, until recently, the idea that there is uh, an anti-white racism did not exist. Today, you will meet people that say, there is anti-white racism. It's a huge discussion also. So sometimes it's not so far from the American debate, but it's not necessary. So the idea of a black identity, the idea of groups identities became stronger and stronger and this led to excesses so the, and to new forms of racism. The same people now can be on, at the same time victims and guilty of racism. This is the point. So now I take the last 15, 15 minutes, which Jan gives me, in order to say something about antisemitism. It's a long story, and I will have I will be very, very short here. First of all, hatred toward Jews in France has a very long history. But it was not at the beginning a racial or a racist history. It was a religious history. France was a Christian country. And in a Christian country during the Middle Age and, and after, the idea was that Jews murdered Jesus, that they are a, a DI side people. And first of all, and the second idea was they don't want to recognize the new religion. They don't want to become Christian. So the problem was religious. During centuries, 
and centuries. Then, in the, at the end of the 19th century, everything changed because Jews began to be considered as racially different, not only regi religiously different. And this is the beginning in France, like in many other places all over the world, of anti-Semitism. So we passed from anti-Judaism to anti-Semitism, but of course, anti-Judaism did not disappear. So I have no time to be more precise, but let's go to the Second World War, Nazis, destruction of European Jews uh, by Hitler, and in France, cooperation, what we call collaboration, between the French government of Vichy, the Maréchal Pétain, and the Nazis. So there, was this, there is a lot to say, but the more important is that after the Second World War, when it was clear that Jews uh, were uh, destroyed by the Nazis, during 20 or 25 years, this issue was not really discussed. And it was just like if anti-Semitism on the one hand and Jew, Jewish life on the other hand were not important in the public debate. We had to wait until the late 60s and the 70s to have a debate coming about Jewish identity and Jewish history and collaboration and what happened with the Nazis and so on, only at that time. And at the same moment, at the end of the 50s, beginning of the 60s, there was a very important transformation of the Catholic Church, which because they decided not to accept any more any criticism of Jews as uh, having murdered Jesus or this kind of thing. So Christianity was no longer, or was less at least, really less hostile to Jews. And during 20 or 30 years, there was no really a big anti-Semitic issue in France. And then in the 70s, things began to change. And two points here. The first one is that in the 70s, French Jews became Michel, we lost the connection, my dear. The connection? Michel, s'il vous plaît. Brett, you see an issue? Um, it seems to drop. I'll um, I'll give him a call. I have his number. Okay, please. What a phenomenal discussion, folks. Okay, oh, and now he is. is it all um, right? Really, I, I don't know what happened. Some things straight. Yeah. No. So, at, in the, at the same moment, Jews became more and more visible in the public sphere. I have no time to say that. A little bit like in the, uh, in the United States. And speaking about Israel and, and culturally visible, religiously visible and so on. And at the same time, new expression or renewed expression of anti-Semitism appeared. And this was visible at the end of the 70s. There was a former uh, col collaborator of Nazis who, who was living in Spain, who was interviewed by a very important magazine, L'Express, and he declared in uh, Auschwitz, in fact, it was only, uh, ah, the poof, I don't remember the name. Uh, it was only um, small insects, I don't know the English word for that, were, that were killed. Um, you know, these insects that children have in the air. I don't remember the English word. So he said, it's only insects that were murdered in the gas chambers. Oh, wait, oui, wait, oui, wait. Oui. And this idea began very, uh, uh, very uh, lies, lies, the word is lies. It was only lies that were killed in, in the gas chamber. And this idea began very important in the French debate with a French professor of literature, Forisson, we developed it, the idea that gas chambers never existed. It was pure invention by Jews. 
and he received some support, including from Chomsky, including, Chomsky. Yes. including from Chomsky, and, and so. Then came another idea, less uh, dirty, but really dirty also. Okay, gas chambers existed, but after that, Jews made money with gas chambers. Shoah business, the idea of Shoah business. So the first point was a renewal of anti-Semitism coming with this idea that Jews invented uh, gas chambers or Jews used them to make money. So this was good mainly for the extreme right, but also a little bit for the extreme, extreme left that we have in France. First point. And second point, we must take into account the transformation of the Israeli state. At the beginning, when it was created in France, the image was very positive. Uh, it was a country where people transform a desert into a, a wonderful place for agriculture. It was the country that defeated Arabs in 1967, the Six Days War. And as you know, in France, there is a strong anti-Arab racism. So th these Jews uh, in Israel were good in defeating Arabs. So maybe we should love them, you know, this kind of idea. So during 40 years, um, 30 years, 35 years, the image of Israel was rather positive in France. But then there was this um, uh, army operation from Israel in Lebanon, the Israeli army came to Lebanon in 1982 uh, and there was a lot of problems and one day Christian militias, Lebanese militia murdered, I don't know, maybe 1,000 or 2,000 people in the Palestinian camps of Sabra and Shatila. The Israeli army was not guilty of murdering people, but they were guilty because they were there and they let the Christian uh, troops do this uh, dirty job. So the image of the Israeli army became dirty and it was a beginning. And then after that, many, many other events made that, the, that Israel was more and more uh, criticized on the left side in France. And the criticism was strong among some leftist groups and among people from migrant origin, because they had some uh, sympathy for the Palestinian victims of this uh, situation. So I don't want to be more precise, but anti-Semitism reappeared also on this side. So during the 80s, we had two new forms of anti-Semitism in France, extreme right with the negationism, the negation of gas chambers, of the idea of uh, show business, and the Israeli criticism, which, be, which was transformed into an anti-Semitic uh, criticism and the idea that all Jews and Israel, it is exactly the same and that uh, Israel uh, cannot be accepted if you are uh, on the left or if you are a Palestinian or if you are a migrant from uh, Arab origin, this kind of it. So this was during the 80s, 90s. But here also, there are new, um, new uh, elements, and this is what I want, um, that, that I want to, to say. So, the new aspects, maybe, there, is, there are many debates in France. Some people say anti-Semitism is mainly, and maybe only on the left, pro-Palestinian, pro-Muslim, uh, zone in the French politics, extreme left and so on. And other people say, and I am part of this, other people say, no, we have at least these two classical, well, two forms, extreme right and extreme left. But there is something new and maybe because time is, yeah, is finishing. And there is one thing which is new and which is very um, uh, important is the fact that we are now having people that hate Jews because they are supposed not to accept freedom of expression. And here I must be a little bit more precise. As you know, uh, we had a, a terrible attack 
uh, which we call in France Charlie, which was a magazine, a satirical magazine. Charlie Hebdo. Charlie Hebdo that published caricatures of the prophet. Okay, this is very well known. And so the journalists in this magazine were killed by some terrorist people. But what happened after that is that there is what we call a comic. You know, these guys that give shows <coughs> whose name is Dieudonné, who used to make, um, to, to support not terrorism, but Palestinian movement and rather leftist ideas on the one hand, but also who made some anti-Semitic statements in his show. So playing with the idea of gas chambers and this kind of thing. And there was a, a, a strong protest by many people in France, including many Jews. And he was obliged to finish with this show. And he had some problem in France when the, when the politicians went to punish somebody, they, they, they sent some a control, a fiscal control. We check, does this, is, uh, we check taxes. And of course, it was clear that he did not pay all the taxes. And so he had big problems and he could not make any show anymore. So some people say, well, when Jews want Dieudonné not to make his show, they are successful. But when Charlie Hebdo, uh, but when, uh, when Charlie Hebdo is publishing caricature of the, pro of the prophet, we cannot do anything. We cannot obtain anything. So it's, there is no symmetry. Then there was a, a small thing, but which will help you to understand what I mean. Four or five years ago, the best French publisher company, publishing company, who is called, which is called Gallimard, decided to republish anti-Semitic uh, writings by Céline. Céline is a great writer and a great anti-Semite also. So, among his books, three or four are totally anti-Semitic, incredibly anti-Semitic, and these books were not republished during many years. So suddenly the publisher said, now I publish them again. And there was a strong protest. And who was protesting? The embassy, the Israeli embassy in Paris, the CRIF, which is the organization that um, represent uh, old Jews organization, a kind of APAC, if I can make a comparison with the with, uh, United States. Some important Jewish leaders, very well known, for instance, Jews who were fighting in order to find who has been guilty of collaboration with Nazis. And so what happened is that on social networks, some people say, who don't accept freedom of expression? Who don't accept Gallimard publishing these books? who also would like more generally speaking, social networks to be controlled permanently, Jews. And so a new aspect in antisemitism was this criticism towards Jews as the enemy of freedom of expression. And this was not extreme right or extreme left. This is part of many different places in the French society including uh, among, um, among, uh, young, uh, among young people. So there is certainly a lot to say more, but I wanted to explain that in a country like France, but I'm sure it is more or less the same in other countries, neither racism nor antisemitism are simple questions, stable questions, sustainable issues, if I can say it like that, they are in a constant process of evolution, which also makes fighting against racism or anti-Semitism something very difficult. But this will be for next year, maybe, uh, Jan, because I think I should now stop with my, with my talk because we said more or less 40, 45 minutes. Um. Michel, thank you very much. This was phenomenal and the, the finesse in the detail and the historical stages is very welcome. And pardon Michel for a moment, I thought we had 
started half an hour earlier than my, I was coordinating you, cinq minutes, etc. So uh, that was simply a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, while people organize their ideas, and there are already a lot of notes in the chat, please, if you want to raise a question, put it in the chat or raise your hand. I will start while you're regrouping, reorganizing with one general point. Um, Michel, when racism turns cultural, cultural difference, is it still meaningful to call it race because of the strong overload to biological difference in race? The Algerians are not a different race from the uh, French, uh, etc. Um, and is this still meaningful, or does it bring us into? Oh, I see Jean Beeman. Uh, is it still meaningful? I give the word, please, uh, to uh, Jean. Oh, okay, great. Um, hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I have a question, a comment, and I will try to be brief. Um, one is that I think in your um, discussion of Islamophobia as it relates to anti-Semitism, I think it's helpful to keep in mind the sort of intersections of a racial and ethnic otherness in our notions of Islamophobia, or our conceptions of Islamophobia, and relatedly our conceptions of Muslims in not just France, but I would say Europe more generally. So I was thinking about um, David Theo Goldberg's work on racial Europeanization and the ways in which the sort of discourse of sort of Muslims as an other category is actually a racial and ethnic otherness. And it particularly is interesting in, Fran in the French context because of course like discussions of racial difference are not as uh, legitimate, uh, so to speak. So that's just a sort of a comment there about what I think is, is sort of differently at stake when we talk about Islamophobia in France versus anti-Semitism. Not to minimize anti-Semitism, but I think there's a different sort of um, register that's being invoked when we talk about Muslims as being too culturally distinct, et cetera. Um, and then the question, um, I just one question is um, actually, I would like to hear you say a little bit more about uh, racism as structural or systemic versus sort of individual, right? So I think part of what happens oftentimes uh, as someone who's been obsessed with racism in France for a long time is that the discussions become around sort of individual acts of sort of hate speech and, and the like, which in some ways I think the state has been relatively um, uh, competent in dealing with, but it's more of the challenges, I think, to address or to name racism as something that is structural or systemic within French society. I think you're starting to see that more and more in um, the ongoing um, protests and mobilizations against policing. And then of course, you know, um, part of that discussion is sort of thinking about the ways that everyday policing of particular populations in France is only an extension of what's occurred under France's colonial empire, right? And so I think that there are, you know, increased demands for the state, for France to acknowledge that racism that occurs, is not, the racism that exists in France is structural, not just individual. And so I would love to hear uh, you say a little bit more about that. Well, so, what you ask me is to enter in the recent and contemporary debates in France. So that's perfect for me. I, I like this, these questions and remarks. So my first point is also an answer to Jan. If I say something like people belong to different culture, but culture can change, culture can mix, we can have uh, uh, people that are transformed and so on, you say something, which means I consider culture as culture. If you say, which is the case with racism, if you say these people are culturally different, but they will never change, they cannot change, it's irreductible, then you introduce the idea of a nature. It's not anymore only culture which is at stake. I am, I am clear you naturalize the cultural difference. If I say these people come from such or such country, but within 10 years, this person or the children will uh, uh, be 
like there was a very classical French song half a century ago, they will become excellent French people, which has been the case with Spanish migrants, Italian migrants, Polish migrants. So if you say they will become French one day or another one, it's something. If you say they will never be able to be different, to be French or American or whatever, then you introduce the idea of a nature and the idea of a race. This is why I consider that what we call cultural racism is racism connected with cultural or religious issues. And I come to your, uh, to your points. Um, so in France, we, you, we, you must start from the French hostility to the idea of race. In, in America, among intellectuals, in many places, race is considered as something which is a, a, a social uh, construction. It is not a biological reality, it's a social construction. In France, no, at least it was not the case. So there was the idea that race is a biological idea and we should not accept it. This was the key point for many people. But things have been transformed as I tried to, to say and new ideas um, appeared. Some people began to speak about uh, race for themselves, not on, or for other people, but in name of anti-racist attitudes, which made the problem much more difficult. Then French people also, French, some French uh, scholars or activists began to use all these American expressions that you have been using and that are really new for France. Intersectionality, it's pure importation, but I will say a few words about this idea of importation. Intersectionality, this idea of systemic racism or structural racism, and I, am, I should be also more precise. So we also invented the category, or we used because it was not totally new, the word Islamophobia, but this is very recent. We use the, the word racisation, racization, racialization. So a new vocabulary appeared, a new category, some of them coming from uh, the US. And we began to have new political discourses saying that the French state is racist. The French, or some French institutions are racist. So some people will say something like, of course you will meet racist people in the French state, in the French police, for instance. You will have uh, a racist moments, you will have racist uh, phenomena, but you cannot say, say some people, that the French police or the French institution are systematically, structurally racist. And this is a real interesting uh, uh, issue. So we began to have this discussion and here we are, the, the, uh, many things apparently come from the United States. But the people that speak, that say that it is coming from the state forget that in the States, a certain number of French ideas have been very important. If I did not with race, but with gender, the first key person in the intellectual story of recent feminism is Simone de Beauvoir. And then you had the French theory and you had Derrida and Foucault and so on. So the movement of ideas is not only from the States to France, it's something more complex. And today we, is, uh, we have some extreme right racist thinkers that are very interesting for the alt-right, uh, the American alt-right. Uh, maybe uh, you have heard of Renaud Camus and the theory of le grand remplacement. That is to say, after 30 or 40 years, there will be so many Muslim in France that we are going to lose the French identity. Just like when people in America say, after a certain number of years, uh, black people will, will be more numerous than other people. So this kind of, uh, of ideas that are very strong. But the influence of American facts and here I come to your point, point is very important. Let me tell you something about George Floyd. George Floyd was murdered in May or June, I don't remember exactly, 
2020. In France, in June, a few weeks after he was murdered, there was a big protest at a time when protests were totally forbidden. We had 20,000 people protesting, not in order to support George Floyd, but in order to support a family who, was, uh, 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 who had a, a young member of this family, a black person, had been killed by some police. I don't go in, into details. So, of course, there was a strong influence of what happened in the emotion coming from the United States, but not as strong as in the United Kingdom, for instance. Because in France, we don't have Black Lives Matter. We, are not, we have some movement, but we don't have something as important. What we have more are some small, very extreme groups. Black Lives Matter is big, if I can say it like that. In France, we have some group, maybe you have heard of Les Indigènes de la République. Ah, I cannot translate this. The indigenous people in the Republic of, or belonging to the French Republic. But these are very small groups and very radical and in a lot of excess in what they say. So there is a lot of things that are a little bit under the influence of what happens in the state, just like we have also in France, Me Too, and we have also feminist and uh, movements that have something to, say, to do with, with what you have in the US. So now there were was, there was some questions in what Jean said. I, I will I try to be brief, but so many problems. Those people that criticize the use of intersectionality, the idea of post-colonialism, or the idea of decolonizing. Those people that criticize the fact that some people use the word Islamophobia, that some people use the idea of institutional or systemic racism. These people that criticize all this usually are defending not necessarily a racist France, but at least uh, 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 the idea that the only way to fight against racism is to pro promote the idea of republic. And the idea of republic in France means everybody is like everybody. You don't have to take into account minorities, cultural differences, and so on. In the public sphere, you only have individuals. And these people, when they are not racist, are defending this kind of idea. But sometimes also, they are very racist. You will find many racism among those people that hate the idea of intersectionality without having any knowledge of what it means, or a very small learning. Many people that criticize the so-called woke movement because they take the American word woke without uh, knowing so much. Those people that criticize the idea of systemic racism and so on. So, and those people that say we don't accept the word Islamophobia. And what is very funny is that the same people that don't want the use of Islamophobia, the same people use the word Judeophobia. So you can be phobic with Jews for these people because they are fighting against antisemitism, but you cannot have, be phobic with Muslims. This is the, the way these people think. So you open a, a huge box, Jeannie, in asking what you have been asking. It's, it's a lot of things. And I think uh, sometimes close to what happens in the States, but not necessarily. Michel, uh, if you can, please open the chat also. You can follow yes. another so, conversation. And then meanwhile, I recognize two questions. Vladimir and Daniel, did you also want to come in? Okay, so uh, Vladimir, and please combine them then, Vladimir and then Daniel. Please, Vladimir. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for your talk. Um, my question is about um, anti-Semitism. In the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, there was mass immigration in France from um, Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia of, um, of North African Jews. Um, and, you know, in large part because of... Um, 
imperial French policy in North Africa that marked the Jews as, as other and made it impossible for them to stay. Uh, there was also immigration from, uh, from Egypt. So this migration has really changed the demographic makeup of the Jewish community in France, not only Ashkenazi Jewish communities, but then there were also Sephardic and Mizrahi communities. So, uh, I, I mean, I see it as kind of anti-Semitism and racism here potentially coming together. Did this arrival of new Jewish communities provoke the increase of anti-Semitism in France? Like, does the anti-Semitism, does anti-Semitism have this new bias against Sephardi and Mizrahi Jews because they were seen as immigrants, as racially different, uh, even more so than the Ashkenazi communities, um, as people who spoke Arabic, right, and had Arabized culture. Okay, so maybe I should answer directly to this uh, very important uh, remark. As I told you, the revival of anti-Semitism in the 70s had two important dimensions. On the one hand, something which has deal with Shoah and with uh, Shoah business and so on. And on the other hand, something which has to do deal with Israel, to be short, okay? So you are right. The fact that many Jews came from Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, uh, Egypt, transformed the Jewish population in France. Before the arrival of these people, the Jews were those people that had been surviving the Second World War. And these people were much more connected with the idea of Republic, and they were also much more uh, connected with a new phenomenon, which was the speaking in the public uh, arena of the Shoah. Speaking, it became a public affair, which was also the case in America, I remember, there was a movie on the American TV, which was called Holocaust, which was a very important moment of rediscovering <coughs> these issues. So this has little to do with the coming of Jews from North Africa, to say it like that. On the other hand, I think that the coming of Jews from North Africa transformed the French community, the French Jewish community, they made them much more visible, much more uh, communitari communitarian in, in their way of living, and they transform. And, they, and so this, this visibility, I suppose, excited some anti-Semitism. And the more you had a problem between Israel and Arab countries and, and, uh, and Palestinians and so on, the more this population, this Sephardic population, was uh, uh, acting much more than the more uh, the older Ashkenazi community. This is too simple, but we should be more precise. But my point would be there. So a great transformation of anti-Semitism, but on at least two dimensions. And one dimension is more connected to the coming of people from North Africa than the other dimension. So this would be this kind of answer that I think we should, we should have in mind. Don't forget that in France, on the one hand, the Jews that came to France could have chosen Israel. They decided to come to France. And on the other hand, the Jews that became strong supporters of the Israeli state after 67, these Ashkenazi Jews, they were, many of them were Bundists, that is to say socialist. Many of them were communists. Many of them did not like the idea of an Israeli state. And they changed their mind, I can say that because I've seen that in my family. They suddenly changed their mind in 67. So there were transformation among Jews in relationship to all what I tried to describe and and it is true that the Sephardic Ashkenazi dimension must be taken into consideration, but not too simply. Merci. Uh, please, uh, Daniel. Yeah, thanks. I think I want to connect to that question, but more like from a theoretical angle. 
because uh, I'm sort of sitting here and still wondering why did you decide to bring together these two chronologies of racism and anti-Semitism in France? Is there like a, a surplus, like an extra insight we win if we discuss these things together? Or is there actually not really such a big connection, which would be just like opening the brackets, the German perspective. I don't know if you're aware, but in Germany, discussions and the newspapers were boiling up this summer um, because there's like a huge resistance to conflate racism and anti-Semitism. Uh, we're very much here still in this line of thought, Dan Diner, Zivilisationsbruch, um, the uniqueness of anti-Semitism that is not to be confused with any history of racism. Um, so maybe you could a little bit deal with this issue, but maybe also like just why is it that you today chose to pick those two things to bring them together? Well, I'm glad you asked this, that you raise this issue. In my country, and I think it's true in other countries, you have wonderful specialists in the social sciences or humanities that deal with antisemitism and wonderful specialists that deal with racism. Sometimes they are far from the two groups are very different and they don't communicate, they don't discuss. So my idea, and I, well, personally, I started, I have been making research beginning with anti-Semitism, then working on uh, anti-Arab racism. I made the two issues in my work. And it was for me absolutely important to say something like, the two issues are different historically, as I said, but the two issues have many things in common. So research, generally speaking, should be organized so that those people that work on racism or those people that work on anti-Semitism belong to, in, to some intellectual communities, just, uh, just one community. So, which means articulation, but not fusion. It's different, I agree, it's different. So you cannot work, uh, 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 you cannot be very good on both sides to say it like that. But if you belong to a laboratory, which has been something which I try to create, that deal with the two issues, it's very useful, very interesting. If you don't do that, you don't understand how much, for instance, anti-Semitism can be part of the life of those people that suffer from racism. And the contrary is true. Today, I will give you a very uh, contemporary example to, to be more precise. Today, we have a very new political phenomenon in France, which, which has a name, Eric uh, Zemmour. Maybe you have heard of this phenomenon. Eric Zemmour is a, is a journalist who is close to the extreme right and who is known and who describes himself as Jewish. And this guy is racist. He's anti-Arab, anti anti-Muslim, terribly, awfully. So my point is, if I want to live in a country where I have less anti-Semitism and less racism, I must be sure that you cannot be fighting against anti-Semitism and accepting racist attitude. And you cannot have, the, of course, the, the, the same, but on the other side. So my point is, the two issues are distinct, but it's absolutely good if we want to fight against each of them to analyze, to discuss uh, the two issues in, in, in with co collective moments for, uh, for that. And this is also true politically. In the late 50s in, in the US, the civic uh, right movement, there, was a, there were a lot of Jews, democratic Jews. Then during years and years, Jews and the black people seem to be very far in their movements, in their action. And I think it's better when they are a little bit closer, which is, I think, the case with Black, black, black Lives Matter uh, movement and some protests and so on. So if I want to be sure that those people that fight against racism will fight also against anti-Semitism and vice versa, 
we need to have research that goes on two legs, but two legs, not one leg. I, I hope I am clear. Uh, and this has been at least my trajectory, my intellectual trajectory. Um, Michel, merci bien. While awaiting next question, I slip in one myself. Michel, the importance and the appeal of what you relate and how you relate it is history and dynamics of meanings over time, including detail. Yet, it seems that the concepts, the categories we use themselves remain wooden. When we talk about cultural difference and at the same time identify culture as something that can be static, people will never change, then we put culture in a box and I'm reminded of Ulf Hannerts who distinguished between culture as mosaic and culture as flows. So uh, the flow character is important. And um, also when we add um, many international flows, American influence, bien sûr, and, and media and so forth, we have so many crisscrossing flows and layered flows, yet we seek to make sense of them with fixed categories, race, racism, and we also turn culture itself in a fixed category, which simply doesn't work. So this is also, so to speak, a discursive challenge. How do we get beyond this? How do we go further? Well, I think that we cannot today consider that cultures are stable and don't change. We cannot think like that. It was the case may, in the past, many uh, anthropologists and sociologists and so consider that we have communities that will never change and so, so and traditions and so. Today, we cannot deal with this idea, even, even if we are uh, looking at uh, very tradi traditional uh, things. I remember a book which was called The Invention of Tradition, which is rather well known. Are we? we can, Traditions are invented also. So the first point is we must be able to understand culture as eventually, not necessarily, but changing. And changing in itself or changing because meeting other cultures and processes of creolization, hybridization, and, and, and so on. So for me, th this is absolutely uh, key. And, but the problem is that in the public debate, in the public sphere, you have many people that refer to stable cultures and that refer, I will say it now differently, to identities. And when I say, so if you say identity can change and my identity is, I have several identities and my identity is a, a mixture and I will, and, and will be part of other identities. This is very interesting, but very different that when you say my identity, I am French, I might defend my French identity. Then it means that you have two, in the public debate, these oppositions between two possible definitions of, uh, of identity. I will say it with a very funny example. In France, some years ago, we had a battle between two categories of chef, you know, the grand cuisinier. The first category used to say, the French way of cooking is classical. We must not change anything. It has been like it has been, and it should be always like that. And you have another group of, of, of great chefs. No, what we are good at the world level because we have been able to accept, to change uh, due to Italian and German and uh, Polish and Arab and so on, ways of cooking. And we are mixing and inventing permanently. So I am on the side of this 
chef. But it's true that it is a, a, a field of battle. Do you consider identities and cultures are being always the same, or do you consider that they are transforming? I think that those people that consider identities as always the same are in a pure ideological way of thinking, but this is strong politically, because when you are living in a world with crisis, with uh, the virus, with uh, losing sense, losing meaning, and so on, it's good to say, oh no, I have some, some, something which is stable, my identity. So it is strong in the general way of, of thinking. So this would be my part. There are two, two sides in identity uh, definition. Now see, please, uh, I acknowledge uh, that is Abdul. And after that, I see so many comments, uh, lovely comments. Um, uh, Catherine Nassi has been made many contributions. Uh, David Willis. So please, and also Marcus, whoever wants to come in after. Um, Abdul, please. Okay. Am I audible? Audible, yeah. yes. Visible, yeah. no. Uh, <laughs> First of all, uh, uh, Dr. Michelle, thank you for such a nice talk. Uh, and I agree with most of your points, especially uh, with the point that uh, religion uh, was, religion still is, and it will uh, remain a source of racial discrimination. Uh, and uh, on the basis of that religious discrimination, uh, or on the basis of religion, uh, Jews were discriminated historically, it's a fact. Uh, and uh, even at the time of uh, uh, Jewish uh, discrimination, when they were discriminated all over the world, the Muslims, especially uh, the Middle Eastern Muslims, they were the ones who welcomed and who accepted the Jews. It is a historical fact. Uh, but now the irony is uh, that uh, most of Islamophobia or the thinking or the force behind Islamophobia and uh, racial discrimination against the Muslims uh, is directed uh, from the uh, centers where uh, most of the Muslims think that uh, Jews are in uh, command. Uh, especially in the United States, uh, uh, all the presidents who are supported by the APEC the American-Israeli committee, uh, they are the ones who uh, talk about uh, uh, anti-Muslim feelings, anti-Islamic feelings, Islamophobia, or Islam as a threat. Uh, and other, uh, in other countries, uh, in, especially in Europe, where uh, Christians are leaders, their leaders, they uh, who, who, who criticize Muslims or who says that Islam is a threat or blah, 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 they are supported by uh, Jews or they have a soft corner for Jews. Uh, the best example is that uh, uh, in this recent uh, Hamas and Israeli uh, small war or clash, uh, Pakistani foreign minister was asked by uh, BBC uh, and when he responded that uh, Israel has uh, deep pockets in international uh, or global media, so he was accused by the uh, BBC of being anti-Semitic. So uh, for me, the irony is that uh, today, Islam is targeted by the people which Islam helped, accepted and supported when they were targeted in the uh, rest of the world. So that's my comment. Uh, and I uh, accept this thing that uh, modernity or accepting modernity or internalizing modernity is uh, the main point. Uh, because in Muslim countries, especially in my country, in Pakistan, uh, the people who are accepting modernity uh, and they are willing to um, internalize the Western culture or the modern culture, uh, they are listened uh, or uh, their views are uh, accepted by the West and they are even helped and 
their human rights are taken care of by the West. But those Muslims or those people uh, who are not willing or who are not ready to internalize modernity and keep their own culture, so uh, their human rights and uh, uh, discrimination against them is not recognized by the West. So this is my comment. Now I have a question. Uh, one of uh, his lectures, Jan said that uh, Islam is a trade religion, as it is called as a trade religion, because uh, in most of the cases, the spread of Islam happened due to the trade relation between Muslims and other people. So do you really think that as I have seen that most of the Muslims who migrate to the West or Americas, they start businesses uh, in those countries. Do you think that uh, there is to anti-Muslim discrimination or Islamophobia in the West, uh, especially in the United States or in France? Thank you so much. Well, this makes many, many things. So let me answer at least on some points that you have been raising. My first point is that in many cases, in many historical cases, you will find people that help Jews or support Jews and people who hate, who, 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 that hate Jews and that murder Jews. You have also some countries that at certain moment have been in favor of Jews and at other moments have been hostile to Jews. In Poland, for instance, which is a country I know rather well, Poland was considered as a wonderful country for Jews during two or three centuries. But I can tell you that it became a very anti-Semitic country at the end of the 19th century. So the same country, you can describe it as very open-minded toward Jews or very hostile to them. And I will certainly say the same with at least a certain number of Arab countries where Jews were uh, supported, helped, and so on at that time, and also uh, uh, murdered at other times. I must also, I am not an expert, so I, I speak very carefully, but we must also take into account the fact that uh, Jews in many uh, Muslim and Arab countries have been considered as second zone, second category of people. They have a special statute, which is called glimi, I don't speak Arabic, so I will not do as if I could. Yeah. They, they, have, they are not exact, they have not the same rights than other people in the country. So I agree with you in some situation, it has been wonderful to live together. And for instance, in Spain, there have been a certain moment, wonderful meeting between Jews, Christians, and Muslims, where they have been discussing wonderful ideas and so on. But sometimes also they have been fighting uh, together. My uh, second point is that we can, cannot have a real uh, solid uh, dis debate if we don't take into consideration the fact that many things that happen in the Middle East have been, are projected on our domestic debates in France, in America, and so on. That is to say, thinking globally is to take into account the fact that we have at the same time internal or domestic dimensions and global world dimension, mainly coming from the Middle East. So it's always difficult to, uh, to, 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 to discuss. My third point is about, uh, and, and this is maybe my key point, is about Jews supporting Islamophobia, Arabs uh, being anti-Semitic and so on. Yes, this exists and this is terrible. This is why I answered before that I think we should work on both two legs, working on as uh, scholars, anti-Semitism and racism and being able to discuss together. It is true, it is true that you will find Islamophobic Jews racist Jews. It is absolutely true. It is true that you will find anti-Semitic Arabs or Muslims or black people or whatever. It is true. And so you can, this is something which is possible. I, but we should never, of course, generalize. 
all Jews are not racist, all Jews are not Islamophobic and, and so on. So your last point was not very clear um, for me. C could you summarize your last point about, uh, about Islam, please? Uh, well, actually, it was that uh, most of uh, Muslims who migrate to the Western countries or to the United States, they start businesses there. And mm -hmm. Yon, one of his lectures, talked about Islam as a, a trade religion. Uh, so my question is that, uh, is there any angle to this recent uh, anti-Islamism uh, or Islamophobia? Uh, are Muslims uh, discriminated in these countries because they start businesses in these uh, countries where they migrate? So is there any economic or financial or trade aspect to this? I, I cannot give you a general answer. It, it is true that maybe some Muslims are making trade, are making business, but usually, I say usually, most Muslims that may migrate in some countries, not maybe all countries, <coughs> are rather poor people without economic resources. Their life is very difficult for them. They try to find jobs. They try to be helped by other people. And they are not important economic actors. But it is also true that you will find uh, Muslim uh, actors that uh, are in part of business and so you, I cannot give you a general answer to this point, but I will not say that the economic activities of some Muslims are important in order to understand Islamophobia. It is not, this is not the case. I don't think so. Marcus, do you have a question in that case quickly? We are almost out of time. Marcus, quick point, do you have? Uh, audio, audio. Thank you. Sorry for joining, being able to join only so late uh, towards uh, this really fascinating talk. Uh, maybe a modest question about an intervening intermediate variable about the role of mass media um, entrepreneurs and the media concentration. Um, I just learned that Bolloré is uh, heavily investing um, and it could be a figure who is um, pushing Zemmour the way that Trump was supported by Fox News in the US. Um, it seems a temptation for a media entrepreneurial billionaire to make a lot of profit by fanning the flames of racist resentments or any resentments targeting a minority. How do you see this uh, kind of a dynamic in France? Well, thank you for develop, in, introducing this point. In France, there is a general evolution, a political evolution towards right and towards extreme right. <laughs> and when you have this kind of evolution, <clears throat> you will find businessmen, rich people that support it. And so it is true that in France, the role of the media is important in this evolution. And the new phenomenon, the very new phenomenon, is the fact that the extreme right <coughs> with Zemmour is supported by big media. In France, until recently, the main TV channels could not be really defined in political terms. You could not, you could not say this, like in the US, you could say, if you are with Trump, you watch Fox. And if you are with, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Democrats, you, 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 you look at uh, CNN. You can, you, until recently, you could not say that. The new fact is that we have a tendency today to have media that are a little bit like Fox. CNews, which is a French media, is close now to Fox. So it is true. So this is a very important point. But if we want to really discuss the role of media, we must take very seriously into account the social networks, which is not the same relationship to money and, and economic power 
than uh, uh, TV channels or, 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 or newspapers and so on. But this is so. And uh, the, but it, you are right. You are absolutely right. We are now having some entrepreneurs that support extreme rights actors. It has always been a little bit the case. Everybody who knows the story of Jean-Marie Le Pen, the founder of the National Front, knows that at the very beginning, he received a lot of money from a very rich uh, entrepreneur. I don't remember the name, a man who was, uh, uh, who invented uh, some uh, domestic uh, thing for cooking and so on. A very famous man who had made a lot of money he helped uh, him, but it's not the same when you have a, a strategy, a media strategy, as, as you have been describing. Michel, um, I, your talk is very thoughtful, very rich in detail and history, very nuanced and also very supple and you're also a very good listener, not just a good speaker. So what a marvelous opening of our fall cycle. So uh, my warmest thanks, to, uh, and simply a pleasure to uh, see you again, uh, Michel. Uh, my warmest thanks uh, to you, and uh, thanks to all of you attending. Merci bien, merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Au revoir. Thank you. I hope the next meeting will be real meeting, not virtual meeting. <laughs> Excellent. Bye -bye. Merci bien. Au revoir. Au revoir. Merci beaucoup. Thank Merci beaucoup. Thank you all. <laughs> Quick word for, for those who are still here. Um, next week, we're going to be hosting Sari Hanafi, and who's going to be presenting on soft universalism. So. A very good link between the talks. Marvelous. And it's Sari so is also a successor to uh, Michel as president of International Sociological Association. He made his thesis under my supervision, so I'm very proud. Oh, wow. <laughs> Très bien. Merci bien. Au revoir. Au revoir. Thanks, everybody. Bye.